Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Terry, for that introduction. Thank you to the Western Australian Cancer Council and to your staff, to Melissa, for all the hospitality and the welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to speak to this topic of navigating cancer. Cancer brings many threats and challenges. Rosa Niran, an artist, with her self-portrait there is uh, telling us something of the shock, the angst, the distress, and she talks about putting a hand over her mouth but the scream still escaping. Harry Hoffman, anger at the consequences of treatment, the loss of control, <clears throat> the existential challenge is deep and powerful. Donna Lawrence, empower me. My body is wounded. I'm suffering. I need help and support. Restoration. So what is the need for care provision by psycho-oncology, a discipline, a specialty which looks after the psychosocial and spiritual aspects of a person with cancer and their family. And whereas we used to quote data from the 1980s from America and a series of studies across Australia, I'm attracted to this very new study of 2,000 cancer patients from five cancer centres in Germany where they report on their rates of anxiety, 13.5%, of depression, 8.5%. And so we often see about 20% of people with cancer being at risk, as well as some other problems there, uh, in coping with alcohol or trauma. And when we look across different cancer types, we see different rates of distress and depression and anxiety dependent on the tumour, and we recognise that breast cancer brings higher rates than prostate cancer, which is to do with the biology of the woman and the way in which the maternal aspects of the emotional circuits are more available to the child, and so we recognise in society that women are more prone to depressive disorder than men. And sometimes in prostate cancer, in fact, you see more distress being carried by the wives of the prostate cancer patient than you necessarily see by the man, him or herself. But rates of distress have still increased over community rates of disorder. And so you can get a, an impression from a slide like this of the prevalence of distress and of challenges to coping when people are diagnosed. So in this talk in Navigating Cancer, I want to touch on 10 things that will broadly take you through the life cycle of the cancer journey, talking briefly about stress, preventive screening, something about coping and support and how we deal with the threat and relieve distress. I want to move on to talk about the plight of cancer survivors and then move to cancer recurrence and palliative care and finish on the importance of family support. So there are many myths about the cancer experience and a common myth within society is that stress causes cancer. And so the person blames him or herself uh, for having developed the cancer and that's really not helpful. With good research today we can say quite uh, emphatically that stress and personality and depression don't cause cancer and that we don't want people blaming themselves uh, for having brought about this illness. When one turns to consider stress as a, a cause of cancer, we turn to the Danish uh, Cancer Society for some very fine studies where, for example, they've taken cohorts of people who've had a child die and one recognises that as a very stressful life event, as we call it, or somebody who's been divorced and when you study large cohorts of patients who've had these kind of stressful experiences, if, cancer caused, if stress caused cancer, you'd expect more cases of cancer in the bereaved or the divorced cohorts compared to the community matched samples. But when you do those studies, you don't find any increased rates of cancer. And these data point very nicely to the reality that stress is not a cause of cancer and that we help people by educating them about that and relieving them of any guilt. 
In a similar way, personality is not a cause of cancer. In the 1980s, there was talk as there was type B personality being connected to cardiac disease, type C cancer-prone personality became very trendy. But again, there were retrospective studies that had methodological flaws, and today we would say that personality is not a cause of cancer. There's a slight caveat at the bottom there where people who are risk-takers, and you may inherit a risk-taking gene, that may increase exposure to certain things. And, of course, obesity, smoking, alcohol, and exercise lifestyle factors uh, to the extent that people take up these lifestyles, learn about them in a family, then that may put them at risk. Depression's been another key question. Does depression contribute to the onset of cancer? The answer is no. Six uh, positive associations, but 24 out of 30 studies showing no link between someone who suffers from recurrent depression and the onset of cancer. On the other hand, if you have cancer and you leave a depressive disorder untreated, then there is an increased risk of mortality that results from that. And we think that uh, in those circumstances, the depressed person probably doesn't uh, go along with the recommendations for treatment as well as a a non-depressed person might. They give in more easily, they give up, and in that way they're at risk of a poorer outcome as time goes by. But when one looks today at these five-year cancer survival rates and you see the number of cancers in the middle there that have been localised, that is, early diagnosis and the very successful outcomes, you see this ground for hope is really uh, very prominent in cancer care today. And that's a key message of this first section. So stress does not cause cancer. It's a disease of a a mistake of DNA replication. It's a long way removed from the stressful setting. And so don't blame, blame yourself for cancer. The second principle I wanted to touch on was just the importance of healthy living for cancer prevention or early detection. And you've had these topics addressed well over the last uh, five weeks of this program, so I'm not going to labour many of these. But it's important, of course, that we continue the fight against smoking. And I like to make mention of the risk of some of the tobacco alternatives that come in from the subcontinent as well as allude to the importance of vaccinating boys for HPV virus. Uh, HPV vaccination has been a very important means of reducing rates of cervical and genital cancers in women. But of course boys uh, can pass on uh, these wart viruses and so having boys vaccinated in our community is really a a vital thing. Australia is doing very well there. In fact, we're leading the world And there are many other countries who only vaccinate girls and have completely missed the importance of vaccinating the young male as well. And our Aussie rates of smoking cessation are doing very nicely. Snooze or snus is a a dangerous substance, I think, coming out of Sweden where uh, people take one of these little sachets and they chew and they get their nicotine that way and it just sustains a dependence on nicotine. So a very bad thing if people were to bring those into the country. And lots of people in South Asia grow up chewing betel nut or arachna nut. And these are bought as sachets of pan and gutka. You can walk the streets of New York and see shops advertising, come and get your pan here. And these, of course, are are carcinogenic substances that people become dependent on. And many of the migrants in our community coming out of India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, can have grown up in families where that's been the norm. So we need to be very well educated about the dangers of such uh, substances and take care that our society doesn't embrace those habits. Moving on then to the emotional side of a cancer diagnosis. Grief at diagnosis is, of course, a normal human response and we adapt by grieving. So the tyranny of positive thinking is something that comes as a counter to that where so many cancer patients are told to be positive, buck up, you'll be right. And we think of this as the tyranny of positive thinking. 
The cartoon over here says, uh, as a positive thought for the day, when you feel that nobody loves you, nobody cares for you, everyone is ignoring you and people are jealous of you, you should really ask yourself, am I too sexy? <laughs> so positive thinking is something that society puts out as a mantra. And yet it can be a form of avoidant coping. And it's important we recognise how normal it is to grieve before we hope for that better outcome. Psychoanalysis long ago recognised that mourning is a normal adaptive response. And when we experience loss or adversity, we have to, as human people, grieve and adapt as our way of coping. So how then do we cope? What are the types of strategies that are beneficial? And we don't want this kind of avoidant character over here. We see people coping adaptively through either problem-based coping, emotion-based coping, or meaning-based coping today. When we're problem-based, we learn about the illness and work to achieve mastery. The emotion-based copers like to share the story, share the narrative, talk about it. And meaning-based coping has been recognised as being just as important, although it wasn't there in the 1980s in 101 psychology, but in identifying what matters in life, what is important in life. So some tips about how to become a better problem-based coper, learning about your illness. I'd like to suggest that you ask your cancer doctor if you can record an important consultation. Take a little iPhone or any means of recording that consultation where key information is going to be sh shared with you. See if, in fact, you can just push the buttons and make your own recording. You take that home, you can listen to it again, you can share it with your relatives. And over two or three efforts of listening to it, you deepen your understanding of what is important to come to, to, to make sense of. Be confident about asking physicians questions about benefits versus risks. And of course, it's always sensible to take a friend or a relative along to a key consultation where key treatment planning may occur so that they can also integrate an understanding and be able to talk it over with the index cancer patient at a later event. A key thing, of course, is checking understanding. And when we're trying to train surgeons and cancer doctors to communicate more effectively with patients, we teach them to ask the patient to say back what they've understood the physician to share with them during the consultation. But I want to say to you as a community that it's also very important that you feel empowered to check your understanding. You can say to your physician, let me just see if I've understood this correctly. I've heard you say A, B and C. Have I got that right? And if you use that technique as you communicate in the important consultations, then there'll be clarification about whether you've got this right understanding of what's important and you can take that data home with you. So alongside problem-based coping, emotion-based coping is very important as our way of coming to terms with bad news. Tears are normal and sharing our worries, our fears, our concerns with others in our family and our friends, that sharing process is a very important adaptive process. It's part of how we cope. And so the key is to find somebody who will be a good listener and that you can respond to by saying, thanks for just listening. Meaning-based coping is yet a third important, <coughs> crucial mechanism that as human beings we use when we try and adapt and cope. We can learn something new any time we believe we can. And life isn't about necessarily waiting for storms to pass, it's about learning to dance in the rain. So whether we make use of our philosophy of life, our spiritual ideas, our religious attitudes, beliefs, we need to search for what is meaningful in any event, any journey, any component of life that unfolds for us. And as we make sense of what's meaningful, we'll find that that supports our coping and helps us to adapt. 
We might then go on and say, well, how important is support in journeys of this sort? And having trusting family and friends is is a key thing. Good data now points to the fact that social isolation is a real danger to the human person. We're really relational creatures. We need our relationships, our friendships. And so there's very good data that people at a societal level, at a population level, who are single, who are separated, who are divorced or who are widowed, these people in fact have higher mortality rates from all diseases, including cancer. And it reminds us as care providers that we should be recognising people who are more isolated because of these aspects and we should be ensuring that their support needs are appropriately met. And groups are a very important and helpful way of learning about an illness and empowering the individual through the knowledge that they gain from that group process. Here's some hard data from a study that looks at social networks and mortality risks and just re-emphasises what I've said about people who perhaps are socially isolated, lack close relatives, lack friends, and uh, may not have children who are there to support them. These data are joined from a large nurses' health study that was conducted, and it shows these significant increases in the risk ratio of uh, mortality outcomes of death if people are unsupported. And so it emphasises for us the principle of support And of course the cancer group is an optimal way for many people, particularly people who may be socially isolated, to meet other patients who are journeying in a comparable way, undergoing similar treatments, and can use the group process as a way of being educated about their cancer and receiving help and support. When groups are working well, then you see humour being present. It's not all doom and gloom. You see people pursuing their stories of authentic living. And in groups, people learn to talk about how to improve their relationships, including relationships with the doctor, with the cancer treatment team. They learn how to adapt to the illness through a growth of knowledge about the illness and its treatment. And they come to accept some of the side effects of treatments, I would perceive, and really learn to adapt and to live with those with courage and to move forward enthusiastically with life. So mature groups become more creative. And on your right-hand side of that slide is a book that was written by a group of women in a breast cancer, advanced breast cancer support group that I had the privilege of leading in Melbourne over an eight-year period. And that book was the way that those women told their story of their illness and their journey and their families and they left that as a legacy to the family members that they were leaving behind. And so it's an example of how group support can really bring forth very creative human endeavours that bring uh, blessings and benefits to the people involved therein. What becomes important in cancer care today is to train uh, people who are going to be leaders of cancer support groups to ensure that they're skilled in their ability to support the group and help the process to be a very adaptive one for all who are taking part. So Rachel Jordan was a person uh, as a psychologist in New South Wales who did her studies in developing a program of training and of upskilling for people who want to be cancer support group leaders to teach them ways in which they can facilitate and help the group to be a good listening group that's truly supportive of the group members, Uh, to help them to think about how to prepare new group members who are planning to join the group, how to say goodbye to people when they're finishing up and leaving the group, how to maintain uh, the safety of the group and the uh, appropriate ways in which uh, leaders bring good leadership What happens if a person's had cancer themselves and they want to become a cancer group leader? How do they deal with their own personal experience and not let that dominate the group, but allow the group to go about uh, doing its own work and therefore being effective and helpful to the group members? 
So today in Australia we have programs that can train people in becoming effective group leaders and we're increasingly moving to a mindset from a psycho-oncology perspective that we need uh, very skilled group leaders to be able to ensure that the cancer group is truly supportive and is a welcoming and uh, an invaluable experience for those who pursue that source of support. Now, psycho-oncology as a discipline then can very much help with the distress that cancer can bring. And some of this needs to recognise that counselling then is important and helpful, that the expertise of the counsellor is a really quite a crucial thing. And here in Perth, you have a psycho-oncology service which is linked to the Western Australian Cancer Council and where people can receive referrals and contacts. And I'd be a great advocate for people who are distressed getting proper professional support uh, in the help that they need to uh, overcome some of the tougher aspects of their journey. And that's not to say that sometimes good GPs won't equally be effective counsellors, but you can certainly, if you need more time, if you need professional support, you can find uh, uh, appropriate counsellors to deliver that support. Today we like to argue that uh, whereas people talk about vital signs in medicine, things like your temperature, your blood pressure, your pulse, palliative care a decade or more back, brought in the idea that pain and pain relief is important. So pain was advocated as the fifth vital sign. And psycho-oncology today advocates that distress is the sixth vital sign and that all cancer patients are entitled to have support to help relieve their distress. So here's a person sitting with a menu at a restaurant and he's asking there, what will change my life? You might say it's meaning-based coping. It's a, a key question. But in terms of the support that counsellors can give, we've got very strong evidence today of the effectiveness of people receiving counselling or what might formally be called psychotherapy in psycho-oncology. This is a busy slide, but um, it in fact has some, some information that tells us that we're very effective in treating anxiety and depression that groups can be more, more powerful than individual therapy approaches. And so the, uh, the group is an important uh, mechanism of support. But individual counselling is still important. And at the bottom of this slide, it reminds me that skilled therapists achieve better outcomes than those who are less skilled. But also the dose of the therapy is important. And so there's a difference between going to a counsellor for one or two sessions, going for 10 or 12 sessions. The more that people are willing to expose themselves to that more solid program of counselling, the better outcome they'll receive in their adaptation and in their ability to become a more effective coper in dealing with their illness. So we should think about the place of psycho-oncology services in cancer centres and oncology units today, in having appropriately trained psychologists and social workers and nurse practitioners who can provide this level of more sophisticated um, counselling. And we need as programs to think about who do we target, who is the uh, audience that we should be seeking to reach. And of course, people who are isolated and people who are depressed are important targets for us to uh, engage with, as is the role of family meetings. Not enough family meetings happen to allow the family as a whole to come in and support the cancer person. Moving on then, the, of these 10 topics that I wanted to just scan across to give you a broad perspective today, the seventh is the question of becoming a cancer survivor. As Oncology becomes better and better at treating cancer as we see 65% of adult cancer patients become survivors of their cancers and 77% of children who develop a paediatric cancer live to survive their cancer. This issue of becoming a survivor and of then living with the consequences of the treatment of the cancer 
becomes more real in our societies. Thus far, of course, uh, oncology is very much focused on getting that cure, on trying to get people to become a survivor. But as we have growing numbers of people within the community who now are cancer survivors, we start to appreciate some of the long-term and late effects that may come about as a result of their treatment. And some of these late effects are important for people to have good knowledge of so that they can manage their health well, so that they can avoid uh, late consequences of those uh, effects that, that could otherwise come about. So, for example, one can see people who at a young age have a lymphoma or a Hodgkin's disease treated, and they may have that uh, treatment delivered at age 20, and they're then grateful to get a cure and to overcome that cancer. But there's news for them dependent upon the treatment that they've needed to have. Uh, when they get into their 40s and their 50s, there may well be late effects that come about from the cancer treatment. Some of them may have had radiation therapy as part of their uh, treatment of their lymphoma, and they may get secondary cancers. So I see patients who've had secondary breast cancer, secondary thyroid cancer, secondary tongue cancer, head and neck cancers. That's come because the field of radiation that treated their lymphoma in the first place 20 years before uh, has affected that part of their body. They can have vascular disease, they can have uh, a weakening of the uh, musculature of their heart come about as a result of uh, the cancer treatment that they've received, some chemotherapies, for example, leading to some weakening of heart muscle. So if you're a younger cancer patient and then you make it into middle or old age, then you live with consequences. And studies of children who have had cancers treated show that 20 to 30 years later, 70% of those children end up with chronic health morbidity problems, chronic health problems that they have to learn to manage as adults. So this is the story of what the journey of cancer survivorship can be like. And behind it is the need for people who have had a cancer treated to really understand the long-term consequences of that treatment. So we get to that today by uh, believing that there's a place for oncology and cancer care to develop what we call this cancer survivorship care plan. And the idea here is that the uh, people who have treated that person empower that person by giving them a written care plan that spells out all of the potential risks, not just in five years, but in 10, 20, 30 years' time. And that care planning then should lead to knowledge about future anti-cancer screening. Um, blood tests such as monitoring cholesterol levels, exercise programs, weight control, healthy lifestyle principles that really help the person who's now become a cancer survivor to appreciate ways to optimise their health as they journey forward. And if that care plan is a paper copy that they can take home in their hand, they can share it with their GP, they can um, have it as a, as a point of reference in the years to come, they can really increase their knowledge and understanding of their consequences of cancer treatment and do very well in health promotion and appropriate anti-cancer surveillance that leads to early detection if they are unfortunate enough to get a secondary cancer that comes about as a result of uh, the treatment of their primary cancer. So this is a new story. This is a story that uh, cancer services around the world need to uh, do more work on. Here's an example of uh, the treatment of cancer which involves amputation and where amputees have to receive help to cope. They have to learn that they're still able to be confident about their beauty as a person despite the fact that the stump may be ugly, that it might be something that people stare at, that they might have a sense of uh, being altered and they can't see themselves as a damaged person. They've got to be helped to envisage themselves as living with a disability and able to achieve mastery and to go ahead and lead a beautiful life. So amputees groups can be very important in helping such a person uh, benefit there. 
Lymphedema is another example of a disability that people need to learn to live with. And when one looks back into an era before sentinel lymph node biopsies were available in the treatment of surgical treatment of breast cancer and recognition of whether that breast cancer had traveled into the armpit to affect lymph nodes in the armpit. Uh, today, lymphedema is much less of a problem, but we recognize in years gone by when surgeons took out quite a number of lymph nodes instead of just biopsying that very lowest one, uh, that rates of lymphedema were quite high with up to 42% of women after five years of breast cancer survival uh, having evidence of lymphedema. So here's a disability that people are challenged to live with, to be able to perhaps wear a sleeve, as you see modelled by this young mother here, to contain that lymphedema, and all sorts of ways that we need to help them with their self-image, uh, their ability to confidently perceive themselves as a beautiful individual, not, a, not, not harmed, not altered uh, by that lymphedema. Sexual dysfunction is another example of the ways in which cancer survivors may be challenged with all sorts of impacts upon their libido, on their sexual functioning, uh, on, for the man who's treated with prostate cancer treatments, their ability to achieve an erection, and uh, so on really across all cancers. There are lots of ways where cancer surgery may leave a, an amputation of a breast, a mastectomy, or the presence of a bag on the abdominal wall, a colostomy, or if somebody loses their bladder, then a, a mechanism to have a bag collect urine. And so there are lots of ways in which body image is afflicted and people are challenged in their coping to come to terms with the consequences of the treatment that's uh, hopefully saved them from the cancer but brings a new burden for them to live with in life and adapt to. Chemo brain is something that a number of people worry about. The idea being that the chemotherapy, that again reduces the risk of cancer recurrence and increases their likelihood of a cure, um, may as time goes by uh, impact on their cognitive functioning uh, in complex ways that limits their ability. Um, there's a story here in terms of how this cognitive change uh, affects multitasking affects um, complex memory processes and ability to really attend and focus on things. So sometimes one hears of the woman who's been a, an executive and high-functioning person in the business world, having their breast cancer treated, having a program of chemo, and then they say they're just not as sharp as they were beforehand. Uh, everybody else around them thinks that they're absolutely fine, but they themselves know that their brain is just not uh, multitasking the way it used to, and this is the kind of problem that's associated with this. Well, here's a story of uh, twins, and the twin at the top here uh, has had her brain imaged in a, a process called functional MRI, doing complex tasks. She's had chemotherapy. The twin at the bottom has not had breast cancer, hasn't had chemo. So as the tasks get a little more complicated, moving from your left to the right, you see that the person without chemotherapy uh, is using this much of their brain to respond to increasingly complex tasks. But we would say that on the top panel, this woman has, is needing to recruit many more areas of her brain to achieve and manage the same intellectual exercise that she's being asked to perform. So the colours there tell you something of the story of chemo brain. And this today can lead to cognitive rehabilitation programs uh, where we may, through neuropsychological testing, help people to define their strengths and use whatever cognitive approaches, verbal or auditory, that are strengths for that person but also use practical structured exercises which are often computer-based and were developed um, particularly by people treating brain trauma patients. So there are large cohorts of people in the community who may have had a motor vehicle accident, sustained a brain injury, a traumatic brain injury as a result of that. And the neuropsychologists have developed 
computer-based programs to teach them to attend to tasks more successfully, to focus and concentrate. And there's good data emerging now from studies in the US showing that when people engage in some of these computer-based programs, they can have a sense of lifting their ability to multitask, to be able to attend and function better. And so I see a future where we can, with psycho-oncology, do more to help people in that way. So this survivorship story then is one of really building up a survivorship care plan that recognises some of the consequences of the cancer treatment, develops a planned program of attending to that and helping people to uh, really, as they enter remission, know what they need to do, what challenges they're going to have to work on and how they can optimise their quality of life in the years ahead as a cancer survivor as a result of good care planning and appropriate attention to the long-term or later consequences of their particular cancer treatment. Moving on then, my eighth theme is one of recurrence where the goal shifts and the goal of care may no longer be cure, but it may be one of control. It may be one of wanting to view the cancer as a chronic disease and make use of the many emerging advances in uh, targeted therapies illustrated over here that are becoming more and more available today. And alongside that, of course, recurrence brings a, another existential threat, a sense of vulnerability for the person and I think it's very important that we mainstream integrative medicine as an evidence-based approach rather than allowing the vulnerable to spend large sums of money on unproven therapies that may be a complete waste of money. The cost of anti-cancer treatment, of course, remains a concern for the community. And here's a cartoon in which they're talking over there at the door and saying that other pain-killing method is, of course, too expensive. And it would be tragic if our society really uh, was not able to access appropriate and effective treatments uh, because of costs. It's a big issue and a political issue for us today. When we turn to alternative and complementary therapies, people need to get good advice. And the one tip I've got here is to go to the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre's website and look at their integrative medicine website developed by Barry Kesselith, a very renowned integrative medicine researcher who can, in fact, provide very good information about some of the risks. Here's the actual website, and you can go, for example, to herbs and botanicals, read about antioxidants, but become aware of ones that may be associated with increased cancer risk. Uh, learn about the mixed results of multivitamin usage that many might recommend. See that some herbs can in fact bring about adverse effects like increase the risk of bleeding. And uh, in that way, if you're on an anticoagulant because you've had a clot go to the lung, then you must be very wise about the types of herbs that you're taking that are not going to be problematic there. So there's a there are today good websites available that can provide people with appropriate advice there. Acupuncture, an effective treatment for pain, um, likely through the release of what's called beta endorphins, an internal uh, form of morphine that the body has that can relieve pain. And there are some caveats there about avoiding if you're on an anticoagulant or you have lymphedema as a complication of cancer treatment. Acupuncture is being increasingly used and is often worthwhile when the right symptom problem is there. My ninth theme is the theme of accessing palliative care and to do that early so that one is able to optimise quality of life and good symptom control as palliative care is a very worthwhile discipline. Interesting data has come out in the last couple of years that shows that palliative care can actually extend life longer than endless chemotherapy can. And this study comes from Boston, from the Mass General, a very leading uh, centre where they studied the benefit of early referral to palliative care for people with lung cancer compared to those who continued on with standard chemotherapy treatments. And lo and behold, 
these data show that the patients receiving chemotherapy died uh, more quickly than the patients that were getting early palliative care and good symptom control. And so it gives a, a very important message to medicine that one must, in fact, uh, bring the palliative care team in early alongside the oncology team uh, to help with good symptom management. And here's evidence in the pink where a measure of depression, a measure of anxiety, shows those getting the palliative care approach were much less distressed, much more helped with those sorts of symptoms than people receiving standard oncology care from their oncologist. Another way that we're working in a palliative setting to help people cope more effectively today is to use meaning-centred therapies. And here's one example of a meaning-centred therapy that we trialled at Sloan Kettering, which showed a capacity to help people discover meaning in their life despite cancer, to understand the coherence of their journey in life, to find sources of creativity and appreciation of art and nature that restored a level of meaning in their life and that helped people to improve their sense of spiritual well-being, to know the sources of meaning and to use that meaning as a way of living life out fully until death finally intervened. Another therapy approach that's used in palliative care is dignity therapy, where the person's life is celebrated by working out uh, how to remember them, what they've accomplished, what hopes they have for their family, what legacy they want to pass on. And I've come back to Melbourne and seen at Caritas Christian Hospital, uh, hospice in Melbourne, the volunteers have been trained to do this model of intervention. They go and interview the palliative care patient in the home care services. They type up their story of their life. They help them celebrate the dignity of their life and share that with their families. And the volunteer program have done that now to over 300 palliative care patients in a short uh, period of time and helped to deliver a lot of good through that sort of mechanism. When we look at this model of therapy, dignity therapy here, giving these results compared to more ordinary, supportive and usual palliative care approaches, we see in this slide that dignity therapy can help the cancer patient to have a deeper sense of their worth and value as a person, to be more in touch with their spiritual well-being, to feel that their family appreciates them and to allow them to help their family. So that's an example of some of the outcomes that can result from that model of therapy. And in my own research program that's been more directed towards couples and families, here we've got an example of a, a couple therapy uh, where we've particularly focused on prostate cancer where intimacy may be lost as a result of the waning sexual interest of the prostate cancer patient. And we've been able to train couples to communicate more openly, to self-disclose and support and be constructive in how they approach things so that we can foster and sustain intimacy uh, for the couple despite the fact that sexual function may wane, uh, but intimacy is very important uh, as a source of support. A little cartoon where they've been having couple therapy and she says, look at you. Finally, family support. Families, of course, are, are there intimately involved in the cancer journey and especially more so when recurrence and palliative care come to the fore. Some families are prickly and we need to help families to optimise support. And the principle that I've long taught is that bereavement care begins during palliative care. You don't wait until after the uh, patient's been lost and then think about how you support the family. That family support should begin in the palliative care context and then journey forward over that first year of bereavement. And by doing this, we can actually prevent the development of cases of depression and chronic grief uh, in the bereavement setting. Some families are prickly, others are colicky, and families can be challenging. About 20% of families in our community have some level of difficulty relating to their members and needing some help. Here's a cartoon saying, I don't want to remember her like this. 
There was that mean thing she said back in 1981. So there are families that need extra support, families that really struggle in their communication, that in fact are, are not very cohesive in their teamwork and who have levels of conflict. Perhaps they have a psychiatric Leo member. Perhaps there are language barriers and cultural challenges that are there. Perhaps there are families who have young children. And, you know, if you're a parent with cancer and you see that you're going to die and you're going to leave children or adolescents behind, then there may be a need for family support. And so we've developed a model of preventive family work that commences in palliative care and extends into bereavement that shows that we can actively prevent depression in people who are at risk when they begin compared to those who receive standard cancer care and the depression goes untreated. So family work is very helpful and supportive. Even though here it says, I never thought I'd have to move back in with my parents. But bereavement care delivered through a family model can be extraordinarily helpful to the bereaved and is a very fine way that psycho-oncology and palliative care can make a contribution. So I'm finishing with a little bit of marketing because this book I've been told by many people who are non-clinicians that they've read it and understood a lot about the challenges of family life in cancer care. And this is just to let you know that when a discipline such as psycho-oncology has its major textbook come to a second edition, it's there, it's survived, it's... Uh, going forward as a discipline in its own right. We have uh, good studies of how to help cancer uh, specialists become better communicators today. Uh, very good work. And we have lots of textbooks that are available to help psycho-oncologists be better counsellors, better deliverers of group or family or couple therapy programs. And so there's so much that we can do to relieve distress and promote well-being and improve the outcomes for people receiving cancer care. Mm -hmm.